Hello, this is Kelly Fitzpatrick with Red Monk here with a quickish take on some of the experiences that my excellent colleagues, Kate Holterhoff and Rachel Stevens and I had at the 2023 Formula One US Grand Prix in Austin, Texas. Amazon Web Services or AWS, which has an existing partnership with Formula One, invited us to this event so that we could report on AWS technology in action. This was an action and data packed weekend for Red Monk. And in order to capture some of our immediate takeaways, I managed to get Kate and Rachel mic'd up and on camera after our first day at the event. So my job today is to give you some context around what we saw and then send you over to Kate and Rachel for their excellent insights. So first, a little bit about Formula One. It involves really fast custom built race cars and to prepare ourselves for the experience beforehand, my colleague Rachel filmed a series of really great get ready with me videos to learn more about Formula One. So check those out if you get a chance. In addition, we also watch Netflix's documentary series, F1 Drive to Survive. And for more on the series itself and impressions from Austin, here are Rachel and Kate. I, I, I watched Drive to Survive just to try to like as a crash course to get ready for this, but like I'm 100% gonna keep watching it afterwards. Like I think the show's incredible. Like I really enjoyed the, the drama of it. Like it's, it's very good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the Grand Prix here is, is really taken over. And I mean, just the number of folks who came to watch the qualifiers yesterday, it was, it was uh, beyond anything, especially Man, as, as hot as it's been. It's a hot day. Hot. It was, it's, 96 degrees in October in Texas. Like, come on. I know. So what is a Grand Prix event like? On Friday, we saw a practice session, which is where drivers test out their car setup on the actual circuit because the tracks and track conditions can vary from location to location. Later on Friday, we saw the qualifiers, which Kate Mitchell mentioned, in which drivers are going for their absolute fastest single lap. And in Austin, each lap is about 5.5 five kilometers or 3.4 miles. The fastest lap times on Friday determine the starting position for each car during the main race on Sunday. So fast forward to Saturday, where the main event was a 100 kilometer or 62 mile sprint race, which is a totally different event from the main race on Sunday. And then on Sunday was the main event, the main race, 308.4 kilometers or 191.6 miles. While we saw the U.S. Grand Prix in Austin, the number and location of Grand Prix races in a Formula One championship season can vary. In 2023, this schedule started in very late February with a kind of test session. And the last Grand Prix wraps in late November for a total of 23 rounds in addition to the test round. Often, Formula One events will happen on back-to-back -back weekends, meaning that the entire F1 production, including all 10 teams with two cars per team, and the F1 staff itself has to pick up and move to an entirely different country sometimes in a matter of days. We were in Austin one weekend, the next week in the entire operation was off to Mexico City and Sao Paulo, Brazil was on the docket for the weekend immediately after that. Red Monk was at the Grand Prix courtesy of Amazon Web Services or AWS who were excellent hosts throughout the weekend. They set us up with tickets to something called the Paddock Club which is the type of place where when you walk in the door they immediately hand you a glass or a bottle of sparkling wine. AWS also set us up with some pre-briefings on the sport itself, the relationship among car, driver, and race engineers who are trying to optimize everything. And we also got to see some of the data that race engineers leverage to optimize elements involved in the overall performance of the car. In addition to their own experts, AWS set us up with personnel from both Formula One and the Ferrari team, both of whom have partnerships with AWS. One event that really stood out for me was our visit to the Formula One Broadcast Center or Event Technical Center which is on site and is responsible for sending feed and data for broadcast and also sending data to the teams. It is currently staffed by about 300 people with 170 people on site. And keep in mind that site moves around sometimes week to week and 130 at their home base location in UK. We got to speak with Pete Samara, who is the Director of Innovation and Digital Technology at Formula One. It's a fairly important job. And one of my, one of my like very specific takeaways from the event was how important latency is to the technical center. And it's really interesting how the technical center handles latency, especially given that every broadcast is from a different location around the world. And what they figured out was that rather than achieve the absolute minimum latency that they could at any given moment, what they aim for is a minimum consistent latency, because if they have that consistent latency, they can plan around it and everyone does better, whereas a more variable latency can be tricky. And I believe that Pete said that from Australia, the race location that is farthest away from the home base in the UK, 
they could consistently achieve a latency of about 300 milliseconds. So now that you have some sense of what Formula One is all about, and some of the very cool opportunities that Red Monk had at the Grand Prix event in Austin, courtesy of AWS, let's check, check in on Kate and Rachel for more of their takeaways from the event. So Rachel, some of the things that we've been hearing about um, F1 and its relationship to AI is that there are these real parallels that customers are seeing. So what are some of the ways that you've heard AWS folks uh, and, and that entire community talk about um, how AI is going to innovate? I was really surprised by some of the answers. We were able to talk with was it Pete Samara. Was that the right name? Yes. Yes. Pete Samara. He's delightful. And he helps run the on-site like data side at the F1 track. And then they coordinate all of their data back to a central location in London. And then they broadcast it all out to the world. It was an amazing operation. And somebody asked him about Gen AI. And I was certain in my head that in, in my head, like the latency of like type a question into chat GPT and watch it like type out a response. It's like with a operation like theirs where the latency is milliseconds, there's no way that Gen AI can fit in to that. And he had some really amazing um, ways that he was talking about it in terms of maybe not in some of that real time way right now, but in terms of helping them figure out right camera shots are like the most interesting things that are happening in the race that they could highlight for people mm -hmm. and using it in um, different ways to try to um, just make their overall analysis better. And so maybe it's, it's less about like, let me type my query into chat GPT in natural language, which they're querying and indexing is absolutely astounding. But <laughs> so it's a little bit less like that, but it's more about like, how can we create a better holistic and more strategic product project or product, which I thought was phenomenal. What about you? Anything stand out to you? Well, we talked to a lot of interesting people yesterday, and I think I'm, like Rachel, still processing all of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we talked to um, Pete, he he spoke a lot about the, the data management issues, and I think that that's where we're going to see a lot of innovation, especially with ways that AI can help with that. And the, the fact that you know, F1's been around for a while, so they've got some legacy systems that they need help modernizing. So it seems like that's going to be a real opportunity for them to, uh, you know, step in and, and try to help with that process. Um, and I, I again, yeah, I, like you, I was really astounded by just what a what a significant operation it is for them to move from city to city uh, as part of the Grand Prix circuit. Um, and then, yeah, just taking into account the audience needs, so not only with the, the sort of education, um, but also with uh, ensuring that they're um, giving audiences what they want out of that experience by, you know, following the stories of the drivers, but also making sure that they're highlighting the capabilities of the cars themselves. When Kate was talking about moving everything like city to city, they are bringing, they like build their own building. Like they have a building that they build. They bring their own fiber. They bring their own generators. It's like they have no outside dependencies. They are moving all of this stuff all around the world every time and like resetting up their entire data center. Basically, it was phenomenal. So one of the things that Pete talked about was mm -hmm. their hybrid cloud strategy mm -hmm. and, and what that um, what that is looking like and how that's going to evolve going forward. Can you talk about that at all? I can sure try. I don't know if I can get <laughs> the details right. Um, so they moved from something that was really, everything was mobile, and they moved to a cloud-based operations environment. They got, so one of your questions yeah. was like, do you just have like all of these years of archived videotapes sitting somewhere? It's like, no, like all of their years of history are all in the cloud. But then they also are pulling things directly down on-prem for latency purposes. So they have things that are existing on-prem in their London-based location. They also have everything stored in the cloud and they have a really complex way of moving things in, like in terms of like their hot and cold architectures. It's like things that are like historical data in F1 for some of the things could be things that happened two minutes ago. And then you also need some of the things that are happening, like what are historic lap times? Like how does this all work? So they have like a really interesting interplay between what data they need current, what data they need to go into like a more cold storage. And so they're using things like Glacier and they're also using all of these like really hot architectures. They've built their own custom, um, when I was asking about their database, they have custom ways that they've done all of these things to make it so that they can access everything with the latency they need. I, I truly 
cannot comprehend the logistics of this setup. Like, it, it must be. It's, it's a really big team of really smart people doing a really hard thing. <laughs> so as analysts, we often get to geek out about data. However, in Austin, we had the opportunity to visit the pit wall in the Ferry garage, which let us see how and where F1 teams access data and translate it into action. For those who don't know what the pit wall is, it is this long sort of island situated in the space between the pit lane and the actual racing lane. The pit wall setup for each team is across the pit lane from the team garage, and team members at the pit wall have access to data via dashboards, comms via headsets, and then lines of sight to the race lane, the pit lane, and even the pit crew. We were in a demo pit wall at the end of the pit lane so that we did not interfere with any of the teams. And here's what Rachel and Kate had to say about the experience, followed by their takeaways from our visit to the Ferrari garage. We got to go down during the qualifying race and sit like right along the pits and like, put on those really big, cool headphones. And you could see the cars in front of us kind of like just streaming past really quickly in like in between the crack in the monitors. But like we had access to all of the data that all the teams so you could see like as their speeds increased and decreased and you could see how their tires were wearing and we could see like how if you could pick drivers and kind of see how they're doing head to head um in terms of their lap times and then behind us all of the people were coming in and out of the pit so there was like all of these cars just like within feet like i was within feet of all of these amazing race cars it was phenomenal <laughs> so fun um but i, I loved seeing all the data and how they figure out the signal from noise and all this like e even they, they gave us the signal like <laughs> they, they they have like a, it was it like a million data points per second or something that's coming off of this track it's like even what they gave us like they gave us like these are the crucial things that you should know from these millions they, they've already filtered it down to like these are the relevant pieces of information and even to me i was like this is still so much to look at so it's like the, yeah. the ability to know um what like it, it is such a technically complex sport it, it was astounding to me yeah i would say sitting on the pit wall was one of the most exciting parts of this i mean they walked us across we had to sign a waiver and then we put on these headphones and uh and you know we, so we walked cool. across the pit while the race was happening like that's an extreme level of trust in my ability to move quickly <laughs> enough like i was it was i kind of a little stressful yeah yeah it was it was definitely a highlight but yeah i mean sitting in front of those dashboards and seeing all the different um, sort of rubrics that they can follow. I mean, it was, yeah, it was really incredible. It was, uh, it gave me a, a deep appreciation for the, the role that data plays in the sport. Oh my God, the garages were so interesting. I was, I, well, for one, I love that they, they each are so highly on brand. I mean, you walk down um, the, uh, the avenue where all the different um, hospitality suites are and all the different cars and everybody is wearing their, their colors um, there were some folks with like branded hats. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. But then when we actually walked into the Ferrari garage, we of course had photo ops in front of the Ferrari logo. Uh, Rachel was wearing her Ferrari shoes. So she was looking, I was very excited. <laughs> like the thing, the thing I struggled with is like they go and like, the whole day is a lot of like, put your hands in your pockets, like touch nothing when you get to go do all these cool things, which was great. But I really, that's the only place I really struggled with this instruction was in the garage is because they had all of these like walls of tires and they all look so smooth. And I just wanted to like pet them all. Right. <laughs> like, I just wanted to tell you it looks so smooth and soft. And, and that was before we like, really understood the role that the soft and medium tires had, how important that is to the race strategy. Yes. And I also learned that each team or like each driver has a set number of tires for the weekend of each type. And so part of your strategy is figuring out which tires you want to use in which race and which weather and which track conditions. And like, it's, it's a huge, like your pit strategy and your tire strategy is a huge part of your race. But one of the things we saw on the screen is like, as the track heats up and your tires get grippier, like the speeds go faster. Mm -hmm. And so we, and we could see that <clears throat> on the dashboard as we, you could see the lap times increase as the, the tires got hotter, basically. I think one of the things that was really impressive to me was that they had the car completely stripped down uh, when we viewed it. I mean, the tires weren't attached. The, they had it on a sort of hydraulic uh, lift, and there were about, I don't know, like the five. The was off. Like, <laughs> exactly, yeah. There were like five guys leaning over it, and they were kind of like lifting up the back and putting it down. Anyways, I mean, it was, it was just remarkable to me. I mean, it looked a little bit like Lego blocks, the way that they would disassemble 
and then reassemble this car. But, but like such a complex machine in their ability to reform it. And they were saying that when they ship the cars from like Grand Prix location like around the world, they basically they have like the little tub that the driver sits in, um, and everything else comes off the car. And they ship it all stripped apart, and then they rebuild the car every mm-hmm. single place they go. Which and, and they have tons of spare parts and all the kit, but like their ability to just and they were saying for the most part they can rebuild the car in a matter of hours, and unless something is like is unless there's some kind of it's major wild. damage. But like I don't know, like the whole thing has made me wish that I studied more science and mechanical things because that's just phenomenal. <laughs> so this is a skill set that is very impressive. So far, we've heard a lot about Formula One. The fans, the travel schedule, the tech, the cars, and the technicians who make everything happen. But at this point, you're probably asking, what about the drivers? Well, to better understand the relationship among the drivers, cars, and the teams that support them, we talked to Rob Smedley, who is currently an AWS brand ambassador and, among other things, a former Ferrari race engineer. He was kind enough to brief us with a presentation on Friday morning before we left the circuit for the qualifiers, and Rachel and Kate also had a chance to chat with him further at the Paddock Club. Here are their takeaways, and I'm also going to let them have the last word on our time at Formula One in Austin. I don't know if any of my questions stood out to me as much as your question around the role of like human and machine interactions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he said in the presentation is like you can there's so much work to optimize the machine in terms of other people's strategy and the heat and the temperature and all of the different things that are going into how you plan to race that day mm-hmm. and they're like it's just minute little tweaks that you can do that can make really big differences in all of your outcomes um, but the one thing that you can't necessarily plan around is the, the driver, driver. And, and so <laughs> you, can, you can do a lot but I, I think one, I think realizing how athletic of a job it is to actually control that race car and the the, like, the reaction times that we see, they did a lot of like slow mos of showing us down, slowing down the driver and showing us like all of the different things that they had to do to you know, correct a car when something went wrong. And like, it was really incredible. And these drivers are so skilled. But then he also gave the examples like what happens if your driver like had a fight with their partner before getting in the car and like all of a sudden they're not in the right headspace and things. It's like so like there's a lot of things that you can't necessarily plan on. Right. And so your question was around is yeah. there ever going to be an a move to remove that variable? Like would you driverless ever do driverless cars? cars? Yeah. And he was like, absolutely not. I mean, that's what people, the, the fans are interested in and having that personality. But then F1 is branded around, yeah, man and machine, which is something that, you know, that, that is, it, it's unacceptable to try to, to, to remove that. But I, I do think it's interesting that, you know, we're, if, if AWS is so focused on data, you know, how is it that we're, you know, you can, you can manage all of these, these aspects that like, and, and, and you know, the, the sort of changes that they're, they've spoken about have been like milliseconds. I mean, the, so, so the reaction time is a big part of it, but then also trying to convince um, drivers to actually follow some of the instructions that their pit crews are, are sending them it can be a challenge. I, I, I enjoyed that exchange because somebody said, like, the guidance that you can use, we don't call it guidance, we call it instructions. <laughs> but, so funny. Um, but it's also things like um, trying to, like, there's team strategy versus, like, personal driver strategy, which is part of it. So it's like, if you want to let the like if you have two drivers going ahead and you want the second driver to go because they're that would be better for the overall team and like there, there's some really human like competitive elements in that right and so like that whole thing is so, so interesting but i love the way that rob phrased it. it was like humans are here to watch humans and it's the human element that makes it fun it's that competitive spirit that makes it yeah. fun it's that element of surprise that makes it fun right and so like we, we can optimize things as much as we can on the machine side but we still have to have that human side to yeah. make it an enjoyable experience for the fans and for everybody yeah yeah one of the things that really uh helped me to to understand the race better because so I, you know we've heard a lot of talks on this and 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 um i think a lot of the presenters have shown us the uh, a chart of the track right and it's this like you know black line around the track and then they'll like show us where like use a heat map to show these hairpin turns and it's like okay you know it it didn't really uh have a a visceral effect on me until yesterday when i was able to actually get uh into 
this basically a a, a, a hayride for adults, which was a semi trailer with a big uh, uh, cart on the back, and they drove folks who were at the paddock club around the track, and we actually got to see this this poor truck driver try to take some of these turns, <laughs> <laughs> you know, with this huge trailer around. Uh, and, and, and trying to imagine what the, the F1 drivers... they like doing it at 160 miles an hour. Exactly, exactly. You know, they have to, like, slow down to all of 89. Like, I don't drive 89 on the highway. Oh, my God. Yeah, you know, so it was, it was really... <laughs> got a daredevil over here. <laughs> but it, it was... It, that, to me, really helped. I didn't... I, I couldn't visualize. I couldn't just feel how large the track was. And I also couldn't understand that these are not just, like, a normal turn on the road like these are actually like exaggerated like they are hairpin turns so just the amount of control that these drivers have they're truly athletes yes. it was that was meaningful and when they talked so when they were talking about the rob smedley part like i loved the part of his film where you talked about the heat maps but they talked about all of the different like major forces so it's like drag and downforce and what were the other ones grip grip and power, power. yeah power but th- but they use the heat maps as like this is the part of the track where this element is most important and then how some of these are offsetting things so like your drag and right. your downforce are might not be the things where you're making trade-offs and how you think about those trade-offs mm-hmm. based off of the track you're on and like i don't know like i I'm, I'm walking away from this just continually being impressed by the drivers and just impressed by the analytics that go into this like it's just amazing oh yeah 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 and i think having the actual experience really helped to make it concrete for me because it was all it all felt very abstract uh you know i can look at a architecture i can look at a sort of schema of how things are supposed to happen i can look at a, a wall of data like we did um yesterday you know they had the monitor up there with all the data but unless you're actually watching those cars go faster than any anything i've ever seen in my life um on the ground you know, th- basically through the fence, uh, you know, we were kind of watching it. Here's the monitor, you know, and it was, uh, they're just zipping by, I, you know, I, that it, that really made it uh, feel more real to me. It, yes. it, it, yeah, it, it brought that data into the real world and, and made it um, much more, um, I don't know, something that I could hold, hold on to. Mm-hmm. It was unbelievable. It was, I didn't realize that this was my bucket list, but it turns out I did something that was on my bucket list yesterday. It was amazing. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're rewriting your bucket yeah. list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you do that where you like make yourself a oh, list sure. and then immediately cross something off? Like that's what happened to me yesterday. So. My philosophy <laughs> is to just say yes to everything. You know, it's like, hey, I've never done this before. I'm all in. I'm all in. So thank you. Oh, it was amazing. Thank you, Amazon, for making this happen. Because like this, sure. this was a like a money can't buy kind of experience. Like oh, this sure. was once in a lifetime. Yes. Yeah.